SPC capabilities are very useful in actually being proactively also detect trends. I know about some equipments that actually store that data. And if you're looking at your control limits, you could actually identify if you are, if eventually your supplier, the parts that they are selling you could be off uh, in their specifications. So that's a good catch. Actually, we have done that. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. While evaluating ERP systems, one of the critical choices you will have to make is whether to go for ERP systems that are supported directly by the OEM or through partners. In the SMB space, most large vendors support their systems through resellers. But some vendors such as IQMS, QAD and IFS don't have their channels as developed and support their products primarily through their professional services teams. Also, before its acquisition by Dassault Systems, IQMS had a very interesting journey. They were growing very fast and had many solutions to support industry-specific functionality. But where does IQMS stand as of today and where do they win most? In today's episode, we invited a panel of industry experts for a live discussion on LinkedIn to discuss major stories in the ERP and digital transformation space and an objective and independent review of IQMS capabilities. We covered many grounds, including their positioning in specific micro verticals and their deeper capabilities than other manufacturing ERP software. Finally, we discussed their product roadmap, history, current cloud capabilities, and changes to their strategy because of the Dassault acquisition. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And we are going to start with intros. Andy, would you like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Thanks, Sam. My name is Andy Pratico. I've been involved with ERP software with for manufacturers for four decades. I've uh, worked all over North America, two thirds of the U.S. states, most of, mostly across Canada. And I also teach people how to un, how to basically how to select ERP software. I have a published book on the topic, and uh, that's me. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Andy. <laughs> Phil, can I move to you next for your intro, if you don't mind? Sure thing. Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Kerper with Ringling Business Solutions. Uh, Ringling Business Solutions helps CEOs and executive leadership teams align their digital transformation strategy with their core business strategies. Uh, My background is I'm coming off 20 years in the C-suite, running mid-market companies, and I've implemented a lot of these types of platforms in a variety of different markets. So I look forward to bring a CEO perspective to the conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Phil. Angela, can I move to you next for your intro? Thank you, Sam. I'm Angela Thurman. I'm the Principal Managing Director for Thurman Co., a program management consulting company in Houston. I have an extensive uh, program management background, primarily in aerospace and telecommunications, and I have I uh, recently left a major U.S. aerospace company after 10 years of supply chain management. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Angela. Sneha, can I move to you for your intro? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Neha Kamari, and uh, I'm a supply chain leader with over 10 plus years of experience working with manufacturing companies and implementing supply chain processes and operations and operational improvements. I have worked with uh, more than two ERP systems and really looking forward to engaging in this discussion and providing my insights uh, from my past experiences on implementing ERPs. Thank you so much. 
All right, amazing. Thank you so much, guys, for the introduction. And now we are going to dig right into the topic. So first thing that we are going to cover today is going to be our stories. So the first story that we have today is coming from Keep. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Keep. This is the CRM system uh, really for the smaller businesses. It's a very small sized CRM. What they are trying to do is they are trying to include some of the e-commerce functionality. Now, that's a very interesting move overall. As I look at the CRM market, the reason for that is the majority of the CRM platforms that we have. I think the HubSpot is the only one that could come across as something that is probably going to have a little bit of e-commerce component to it. But if you look at the integration with marketplaces, obviously they don't have that. So there is going to be a place where we are going to see some sort of merge of the CRM tools as well as e-commerce. Maybe in the enterprise space, maybe Salesforce has a little bit of that. But overall, I think it is slightly challenging. You are probably going to have a CRM tool from different vendors, and then your e-commerce channels are going to be completely different. So this is a very exciting move, and a lot of CRM companies are going to probably move in this specific space where the, they are going to provide out-of-the-box integration with, let's say, Shopify and some of the payment providers. That's it for this story. Yeah, Sam, I was wondering, do you know, you mentioned that it's a, uh, a lower-end type CRM. Do you, do you know what type of uh, market it targets? It's going to be really the smaller size businesses. So I don't have the the revenue bracket for you. I would say their competitors are going to be either Zoho or Five Drive, and Zoho would be slightly more on a larger side. Zoho targets really small customers. Five Drive is probably going to be the smallest one. Keep is going to be probably around that as well, in 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 my opinion. I don't know if anybody else has any experience with this. Yeah, a, a quick comment that that Salesforce definitely is promoting, especially to Salesforce customers, their e-commerce platform, and then that they've been investing in for the last several years. It's pretty functional. I assessed it. I ended up going a little different direction with the assessment we did, but um, they're definitely these guys look like they're probably trying to keep up with the big guys a little bit here, Sam. Yep. Anybody else has any any other comments? Otherwise, uh, I can move to the next story. Okay, so the next story is going to be slightly more exciting for you because it's coming from a vendor called Acumatica. And Acumatica releases their updates twice a year. So this time they have released a very exciting update as well. And the update is going to be exciting. And the reason for that is a lot of the functionality that they have provided, they are trying to catch up with a lot of different vendors that are going to be true multi-entity systems, okay? There's always going to be a debate about what is through multi-entity versus what is not. In their case, what they have done right now is before this release, I think you have had to have different tenants if you had different base currency. And if you have that, then obviously there is not going to be any data sharing. For example, let's say if you are a US customer and you have Canadian entity, if the currency is going to be completely different, then obviously there's not going to be much of a data sharing between those ten those two tenants because your base currency is going to be different. So now at least the base currency can be shared. Even with this release, it still has a lot of limitations based on the way I read or listened to some of their episodes. So it's not going to be a true multi-entity system, such as you know, if you Take an example of NetSuite or CloudSuite Industrial from Infor or Epicor. They are going to be, or SAP Business by Design V1. Those are true multi-entity system where each entity can have different uh, currency. They are going to reside in the same database. There's going to be significant data sharing across those entities. So that's going to be a true multi-entity implementation. So that's what they are moving towards. So that's a very exciting move. They have also made some more advances overall in their majority of the additions. One of the most prominent is really going to be commerce. They, in, they are investing a lot of money in their commerce addition, to be honest. Okay, and the way they are positioning their commerce addition, Acumatica is the only ERP platform that is natively integrated with platforms like BigCommerce and Shopify, okay? And native actually means a lot because that is, that is going to be provided by Acumatica, right? So that's a, that's a big deal. 
So they are really positioned as more of the, the true commerce platform as compared to others. Obviously, NetSuite has a lot of capabilities, but they don't like to position themselves as the native integration. So because of that, they are providing a lot of capabilities. Acumatica also has a POS. I don't know how useful that is going to be for the customers, to be honest, because in my experience, they very rarely work because it's all, almost going to look like a ERP. And most POS operators, they just don't like the ERP screen. So yeah, I mean, even though it is there, I don't know how adopted that is going to be. But Acumatica does claim that they can serve all of your channels, um, e-commerce, physical commerce, uh, your ERP. So right now, they are actually including some of the capabilities such as upsell, cross-sell. Now, this is moving to your ERP. Typically, these capabilities used to reside in the POS system. So now, this is going to be in the ERP. Now, if you actually think about it, the biggest problem that I personally have seen is going to be related to loyalty. Because typically, the, none of the ERP systems that I know of maintain or do or treat loyalty really, really well. And because of that, you are going to get a lot of problems if you are trying to implement, for example, let's say, buy online, uh, pick up a uh, store. And if you are, let's say, heavy in retail, you have a retail front, then you have e-commerce front. You are, let's say, apparel brand or gift brand, something like that, right? Then for you, it's going to be significantly challenging overall to implement your POS, e-commerce, as well as ERP. So Acumatica is trying to get there. I don't know if they are going to implement all the functionality that typically exists in a B2C system such as your POS. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but they have introduced things like item substitution. That is very common in the manufacturing ERP systems. But now they have incorporated that as part of the commerce edition as well. They also have the personalization and the gift wrapping. I was thinking that maybe they are actually trying to introduce loyalty, but personalization and gift wrapping is 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 not as heavy as I like to think of personalization. This is really, let's say you are buying a ring or a t-shirt and you want to print a name on that, then they can probably do it. Obviously, the instructions are going to flow through your sales order to your manufacturing order to your shipping. Obviously, that's a huge ad because a lot of ERP systems don't have that. But in my opinion, this is just a frill. It's not a real feature. Okay, they are doing a lot in the manufacturing sector uh, as well, manufacturing edition. And their visual scheduling platform if you look at it, it looks fairly compelling right now. So obviously they are, I don't know if they have everything as a sophisticated platform such as Infor or Apicor is going to have, but their user experience is going to be far superior just because of the, the quality of the platform. So they have introduced a promise date by using Capable to Promise feature. They have also introduced a feature called pre-assigned lot. Now, this has been a challenge for the Acumatica community for some time, especially if you have to track your goods on the shop floor. If you have, let's say, a process that is going to be slower than your other work centers, then you probably would require pre-assigned lot. Or let's say if you are in the medical device space and you need end-to-end -end traceability, it becomes really difficult if your shop floor is not really designed and you will require a lot of manual tweaking of your shop floor before you can support your your medical device processes. So for that, pre-assigned lot is going to be super helpful. But keep in mind, guys, uh, they still don't have the quality natively built as part of the solution. So this is my challenge. They have the pre-assigned lot, but they don't really have quality. So how are these complicated implementations going to work? So yeah, so that's going to be a challenge. They also have a lot of things they have done as part of their CRM solution. Okay, so the next story is actually coming from Salesforce. And Salesforce is actually trying to introduce Health Cloud 2.0. Now, this Health Cloud is not really positioned for your either healthcare industry or the life sciences industry. This health cloud is slightly different because they are trying to bring the community experience. Okay, this is going to be, let's say, if you want to track your vaccination or if you want to track or integrate with your testing vendors, a lot of companies are going to require, especially if you look at some of the government facilities, they are they need to comply with these compliances. So I think Salesforce is the first one that is introducing something like this. But I think we will see a lot more of this movement. Uh, in the CRM community where you are going to have a little bit of your employee tracking and there are a lot of innovations that are happening in the RFID space overall in terms of tracking the, the employee or, or, or their safety. Now that functionality is going to reside in the CRM, which is 
in my opinion, this is slightly surprising for me because the way the community experience is positioned in case of Salesforce. Okay, and the last story for the day, this is coming from Acton Software. They have announced a native CRM integration with Zendesk Cell. As you guys know, Zendesk has been trying to position themselves as the complete suite as opposed to just the customer service solution. Everybody's trying to get a little pie of the CRM market. I don't know if this is going to be just taking the pie or the pie is going to be bigger for everybody. But, you know, there's a lot of integration that is happening overall in the CRM market. That's it for the story. Do you guys have any comments I can take or I can move to today's topic, which is going to be IQMS? I was just going to mention, Sam, uh, you're mentioning about the Acumatica having the point of sale capabilities. Many ERP systems do provide some type of POS capabilities, but it's mostly like for counter sales, very low volume. And basically it's just immediate invoice is what it is. It's, so it's the same clunky screen that you would probably be familiar with in the ERP, but it immediately it allows you to immediately print the invoice upon taking the order. So that's probably similar to what Acumatica is doing there. Sam, I was going to say the, the news articles have a theme and they're kind of a similar theme from many of these uh, Tuesday night uh, reviews is that these guys are acquiring as they've been doing for years, little pieces of what they think is the puzzle. And my point is it makes it as challenging, if not more challenging as ever for selection to know really where, what did they just bolt on that may not have a lot of functionality, that's a new business endeavor for them, or is it truly integrated? And what is really the part of their platform that has depth because that's what they've been doing? I think it's just really important to know who these companies are as well as what they're saying they do. Yeah, and I agree. And in fact, let me see, these things are changing on a daily basis, to be honest, okay? Uh, And that's why looking at the contract really digging deeper into what kind of extensions they might be using. And again, you require a little bit of technical expertise there, to be honest, to be able to identify these extensions, who is going to be owning at them. So by looking at the packages, by looking at a little bit of code, you know, you can probably tell who is owning. But again, you require a little bit of technical expertise to be able to identify. But let's say if you don't figure this out in your selection process, obviously you are going to have a lot of challenges during the implementation. And Phil, I'm pretty sure you know how this works, right? Uh- <laughs> yeah, it can be very confusing. Everybody know. Everybody tells you a great story, and and as you guys know, it can create some nice screens and a nice demo, but. Not just what they say they do, but who they are. It's just like Salesforce. You know their CRM is going to be buttoned down. But are some of the other things that they're entering in, like this one where they're now a compliance health platform, you know, that's that almost looks like it's opportunistic more than it's a business decision of theirs, right? I completely agree. Okay, any other comments, guys? If you don't have, then okay. So let's move to the IQMS, right? So if you guys are not familiar with IQMS, I'll give you a little background about IQMS because not a lot of people are going to be familiar with that. But before that, I am actually going to give you a little breakdown of the industry as well. Overall, how the ERP industry is structured from the capabilities perspective, where everybody sort of fits. So one of the decisions that everybody needs to make, and that's going to be a critical decision, because that has a lot of implications in terms of how you want to engage with your vendors, how your support model is going to be, and whether you are going to feel comfortable working with them or not. So one of the clear divides that we have in the market is going to be whether you are going to get implementation from the OEM, and that is going to be the company that actually produces the software. Okay, or you want to get support from slightly broader community that is going to be reseller consulting companies. Now, there are pros and cons to both approaches. There are some companies in the mid market. Traditionally, if you look at the ERP market, if you look at major providers such as your Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, they typically like to go with SMB with their channel. And the reason they do that is because it's not really profitable for them. Because as you know, SME companies don't really have as much money as your enterprise counterparts are going to have. So what they do is they are actually going to spin off all their unprofitable segments to a larger community that are going to be slightly closer to the customer so that the cost is going to be slightly lower for them. 
So that's how they have always operated. If you look at SAP, they are always going to serve them directly if you go for the enterprise space. But if you go to SMB space, they are going to have resellers. But in the SMB market, there are some of the companies that like to go direct as opposed to the reseller. Now, the pro of going direct is going to be that you have just one hand to shake or one throat to choke. Okay, that's the saying that you have in the ERP community because you don't have to deal with three different vendors. And sometimes that could be very unpleasant as far as the ERP implementation goes. So in this particular case, you obviously have that pro. But if you actually look at the cons, typically cons are going to be slightly bigger because you are going to be locking down your entire company because your ERP implementation is going to be slightly strategic. When you look at the ERP, you are looking at your sales order processing. You are looking at your invoice order processing. For example, let's say if you are not able to process your sales order, and let's say you don't like IQMS, and now you have IQMS implemented in your company. What can you do next? You cannot do anything because IQMS is the only company that is probably going to know about their software as well as implementation. Tomorrow, if they raise the price, you cannot do anything. So you cannot really shop around. And this shopping around is probably going to be available in with the other platforms that typically like to go with the consulting firms. Now, if you look at their overall portfolio of the products, the way they like to position themselves in the market, the vendors that are not publicly open, the, uh, the vendors that are not open for channels, they are going to be slightly more proprietary. Okay, If you look at their educational material, if you look at their support model, all of that is going to be very closed because the only people who are consuming that material is going to be their own internal employees. So even if somebody else does not understand that, nobody cares. Because IQMS understand that. IQMS is providing that support. Now, this is going to be applicable for all of the vendors that like to serve direct. And that is going to be your IQMS. That is going to be QAD. That is going to be a lot of net rate implementations are done direct. All of these smaller vendors, if you look at the smaller community, for example, you look at Global Shop, Pro Shop, uh, you look at the ECI, you look at DCOM, all of these vendors are serving direct because hiring your distributors costs a lot more money it requires a lot more, you need to invest a lot in your educational material before you can sell to your, a distributor. So their material is going to be slightly more sophisticated overall. So this is the overall philosophy. Again, there are pros and cons to both approaches, but IQMS has always been direct company. Now let's look at the history. IQMS has been in the market for a very long time. They compete with likes of the Infor, Epicor, but you have not heard of them. And the only reason you have not heard of them is because they like to go direct. Because the other companies that actually like to go with the consulting companies, they are going to get far more publicity than the other companies that are trying to go direct. So this company has been in the market much longer than, I guess, Epicor was there, but I don't think Infor existed at, at, at that time. They started in somewhere in, what, 1989? So obviously, it's a very uh, old system. They came to the limelight somewhere in 2015 to 2016. They had won a lot of awards for their innovation. I don't know what had happened to them, to be honest. All of a sudden, you know, that did not happen in the last 30 years. Uh, so in that five years, they won a lot of awards. And I don't know if they were really prepping up to sell their company because in 2018, they got acquired. OK, so they got acquired by a company called, uh, you know, Dassault. And Angela, you can correct me if I'm pronouncing this right, because this is a French pronunciation, which I'm not really good at. But Dassault system, that own solid words. So they got acquired in roughly 2018. And before that, they were doing a lot of work overall. And if you look at their revenue roughly in 2016, they were at about $53 million. OK, if you pay attention to this figure right now, I would say Acumatica is going to be slightly closer to that. OK, in terms of their revenue, if I'm not mistaken, because if you look at the IQMS number of employees in 2018, they had roughly 312 employees. And by the way, this includes your implementation and support as well. Companies like Acumatica are going through channels, so they don't have to have uh, as much implementation and support talent. So one of the questions that you are going to be asking as the ERP buyer is, OK, one company is going to gain a lot of popularity for five years. And all of a sudden, what happens? It gets acquired right by the, a company, and then it's no way. OK, and we are going to talk about all of that. OK? So this was consumed by a very large company. And after that, they simply disappeared from the market. I don't hear about them anymore. 
Okay, so we are going to see whether they are really active, not active. What were the reasons why Dassault actually uh, tried to acquire them? We are going to look into all of that. But overall, from the company perspective, I guess you know they started as the ERP company for a very specific industry, and that was primarily plastics. Uh, that's where they did really, really well. And then they started expanding their offerings to other industries. But for the most part, they were designed mostly for plastics industry to begin with. They are going to have really, really deep capabilities for the plastics industry. Now, let's go to the next slide, guys. If you have any comments, obviously, you can uh, you can unmute yourself. If you look at their menu right now, I mean, they did not kill the IQMS domain. If you look at the, they have rebranded. Now, it's called Delmia Works. And guys, you can correct me if I'm pronouncing this right or not. I am going to pronounce the way it is written. So yeah, so it's, uh, you know, maybe Damia Works, and they, that's what they have renamed. So now they are actually trying to bring SolidWorks branding, because obviously SolidWorks was a very strong product. I don't know how many customers they had, but my understanding is that they had roughly 30,000 customers. And obviously their goal is going to be to sell IQMS to all of the customers, because they are trying to win in the same account that they have already won using SolidWorks. And as, as you guys all know, SolidWorks is a phenomenal product from the CAD perspective. There's no questions about that. But is IQMS going to be the right fit? That's what we are going to review today. So obviously, they are very, very, very unique in their offering because they are going to uh, offer one of the deepest, deepest functionality that you are going to have for specific micro verticals. I don't I am actually shocked at looking at some of their data sheets. The way they have documented, it's phenomenal. So they really have those unique offerings that nobody else can match in the market. Again, you guys can correct me if you see it anywhere else, but personally, I've not seen it anywhere else, unless you are talking about a moment pop offering. And IQMS is definitely not a moment pop offering. Uh, okay, so in terms of the industry, they have positioned themselves as, and by the way, this is not alphabetical. This is the first ERP company in the mid-market that we have seen, uh, you know, has done their many right. They, they are positioning themselves as the automotive first, which I question. There are some automotive uh, specific features that they have, but it's not really as deep and automotive uh, as compared to the other industries. But the reason why they may have structured it this way is because if you look at the plastics and chemicals market, that's a very tiny industry. Okay, it's really small. Okay, but if you look at the automotive market, obviously that's going to be bigger. So their goal is going to be tar to target slightly bigger market. They do really, really well in the medical ERP space. They have some of the functionality that I personally have not seen anywhere else unless you utilize some sort of add-on, even with the companies that are going to claim that they have very industry specific functionality. We are going to review all of that. Uh, they have positioned themselves as the aer aerospace and defense, assembly, food and beverage. So they have the real food and beverage offering, guys. Okay, whatever we saw in case of DCOM, in my opinion, that was questionable food and beverage. This is a real food and beverage. Okay, they are going to have all of your formula management, recipe management, the end-to-end -end traceability recall management. So they have really deep functionality in case of uh, you know food and beverage. And uh, plastics, obviously, that's how they started. So they have very, very, very deep functionality in plastics. They've been a lot of plastics companies, much bigger ones, to be honest, okay? And they have done really well. I have read their case studies personally, and the majority of the plastic ones, they, you know, most of the customers seem to be happy. Now, packaging is very close to plastics, in my opinion. That's why they are doing well there. But we'll look at uh, the specific functionality of the packaging as well, if they have anything unique there. That cannot be supported by any of the vanilla ERP. Now, this is the uh, data sheet from the automotive customer. By the way, one of the things that you are going to notice in case of your IQMS, they are the only one that is actually claiming that they have their own in-house EDI, meaning the EDI capabilities are built as part of the product. Now, if you actually look at uh, the other offerings, for example, Apicor N4, they are also going to claim that they have the EDI offerings built as part of the solution. But when you get into the nitty gritty of the mapping these EDI vendors, that could be tricky. That requires a lot of work. So obviously, this is probably drawing a lot of implementation dollars for IQMS. But I don't think anybody can provide out of the box EDI functionality. But as per their data sheet, they seem to have slightly deep, deeper EDI functionality compared to other solutions such as your Apicor and Info Cloud Suite.
Here, they have very, very, very specific functionality in case of, uh, and by the way, I mean, see, they are also one of the only player that is Honda approved. Now, they could have approved because of their relationship. I don't know where the <laughs> relationship is coming from. Maybe one of the investors that invest in probably Honda may also invest in IQMS. That could be a possibility that they are trying to promote that. I don't know anything about that. But Honda seems to be approving them as the go-to EDI vendor for some reason. Okay, obviously, you have a lot of very specific automotive functionality. Again, I have not seen this functionality even in case of real automotive package. And we have reviewed, for example, Epicor. Epicor positions themselves as the real automotive player, but things like materials management, operations guideline, logistics. Now, in my opinion, it wasn't there. Okay, I, I at least could not see that. And that's a that's going to be a functionality that most automotive companies are probably going to require. When you look at, you know, tools supporting uh, uh, your TS-16-949, some companies are going to claim on the paper, but if you actually ask them, they will probably not have as much support for that. Uh, but it seems like IQMS does have a little bit of that functionality. It could be because of their quality module. Their quality capabilities are really, really, really deep, and it could be because of that. They are going to have some features such as you know your gauge R and R to SPC. By the way, typically you, if you are let's say a manufacturer, you probably need to buy SPC if you are looking for process compliance. Seems like IQMS offers this out of the box. So again, this is where you are going to save a lot of licensing dollars. But I don't know how good that is going to be, how good the experience is going to be. This is going to be a same argument when your ERP provider is going to provide a tool that is probably going to look like an ERP. And SPC can work very standalone. It doesn't need to be integrated with ERP. So I, honestly speaking, don't see as much of a need of SPC. But compare this to your POS. In case of POS, that needs to be tightly integrated because you need to flow your sales orders or otherwise you need to manually enter them. In case of SPC, I don't know if you really need that integration. You can have the standalone SPC tool and that's probably going to be okay unless you are a very large enterprise. So, Sam, one thing that comes to mind for me with SPC is that in some industries, you may need to provide a, a certification or a, 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 a test sample with your shipment to, to show what the, um, the test results are. And so the, those S, SPC capabilities could be very helpful. So you probably don't require SPC capabilities for that. So that is going to be your certificate of conformance, right? And that is typically provided by your quality module. Even if you have decent quality module, that does in process for your ERP system, your Infos of the world, your Epicodes of the world, IQMS, they are fairly going to be even in that capability. SPC is going to be slightly more real-time quality monitoring of the processes. So you are basically trying to draw the histogram and you are trying to identify the anomalies. And once you know where the anomalies are, you can fix the process. So it's very sort of lean mindset. Most lean practitioners use SPC a lot, right. but that's not part of your core operations. It's, it's very ad hoc. No, I was just building on that. Like some of the companies that I've worked with, they uh, sometimes actually ask for gauge RNR results too. And so now I'm thinking because they have this SPC and gauge RNR capability integrated, is that their USP on, you know, the you just went over the varied market that they're looking at. And I was really surprised having medical uh, meaning factors as their as their market uh, segment and you know plastics and uh, so I just feel like this could be one of their USP on why they are able to sell to uh, you know something as critical as medical devices market because they are super focused on um, quality and I know and I'm so like some of the customers to what Angela is saying like they demand gauge on our uh, reports on some of the equipments also that we are using or the tools that we are using repetitively to uh, work on um, some of the products. And if you're doing Six Sigma, you you need SPC. Yep, you are right. But I mean, yep. you know, for the medical device companies, uh, you know, there are going to be deeper capabilities. For example, let's say device history record and the electronic signature. By the way, uh, IQMS has all of that. All of your default manufacturing players are not going to have all of that. I'm, I can almost guarantee this. Okay, so God, you need thanks, to use thanks, that and on. Got it. I mean, yeah, I mean, those are like uh, some capabilities that you absolutely need when you're trying to sell to that kind of a market. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. From, 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 from my vantage point, Sam, you absolutely need it. Is there a savings, either an efficiency or an investment or licenses to have it in the core ERP system? Because like you say, the bolt-ons are perfectly fine. They're great. So is the functionality there in the core system and is there a savings because it's an integral to the ERP? So some bolt-ons are fine as long as they are not part of the core operation, right? The other bolt-ons, let's say if the bolt-on is actually controlling your inventory, that's a horrible idea. You should never get that bolt-on, okay? But let's say if you have a throwaway analytics add-on, okay, that is not really feeding back to your ERP, that's probably okay. You are doing some sort of study in the corner. Nobody cares for it. You know, you are trying to draw the pattern. You are going to take back that study probably to ERP. Maybe you have two data points that you are trying to enter. Now, that add-on is perfect. There's no problem with it because it's a very siloed add-on. So that's how I like to think. And that's why in case of SPC, yes, if you are very deep into the quality process, if you, I don't know, a, a lot of companies are going to claim that they are actually Six Sigma, but I don't know if they actually utilize SPC. What I have personally seen, SPC systems are always siloed. They are typically not really integrated with ERP, but there are going to be companies, I'm not saying that, you know, every company is not going to be integrated. There are going to be some companies that are going to require that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I haven't seen SPC integrated with ERP. So I was uh, like uh, really uh, surprised to see that capability. But I also think like the companies that use SPC are so focused, like quality is so focused about that process. And Sam, like uh, not to derail the conversation, but SPC capabilities are very useful in actually being proactively also detect trends. I know about some equipments that actually store that data. And if you're looking at your control limits, you could actually identify if you are, if eventually your supplier, the parts that they are selling you could be off uh, in their specification. So that's a good catch. Actually, we have done that in my past life. I have personally stopped shipments because the the vendor was not able to provide me with the test data to validate that their processes were in control. Okay, amazing, guys. So I'm actually going to move on to the next because we are running short of time right now. Uh, I'll take more comments towards the end of the conversation, but we are going to look at the the medical device capabilities and some of the capabilities that you are going to notice here. I really don't think anybody can match that as part of the OEM functionality, I can almost guarantee, okay? So you have things like track and trace, you have the product identification and serialization, you have IQ and and OQ. So they are really, really deep into the medical device functionality. They do uh, DHR as part of their core offering, which is phenomenal. They do electronic signature as part of their core offering. So, So that's very, very deep. And that's probably the reason why they really win well in case of your, your medical device. Now, we are going to talk about the aerospace and defense. To be honest, I found a lot of fluff here, okay, in case of aerospace and defense. And Angela, you can tell me if you see a real differentiator in case of IQMS. The majority of the things that I saw here, they are provided by a, a decent manufacturing ERP system. Again, we are talking about uh, likes of the, the, the ones that actually win most, uh, your Epicors of the world, your Enforce of the world. So I just could not find anything that was really unique for the aerospace and defense. And even though they are claiming that they are winning a lot in aerospace and defense, I think the Epicor N4 and uh, IQMS is going to be fairly comparable in their aerospace and defense capabilities. But the only exception is going to be your managed ITAR certification for export shipments. And uh, my understanding of the aerospace industry is You know, ITAR is probably going away. That is actually going to be replaced with the other certification. So I don't know how many companies are going to comply, but obviously, and I don't know how powerful this feature is to be able to provide the real differentiation. So Sam, I would have to say, I I agree with you. I didn't see a lot uh, there that was um, a a strong differentiator, but um, ITAR is not the only export requirement that aerospace and defense um, is concerned with. So yes, you've got a really good point there. Going back to your aerospace comment there, Sam, uh, you know, when I lived in the U.S., actually, I was a, that was my specialty. And of course, there's two different types of aerospace contractors, commercial versus aerospace and defense. And that the listing that you had, it looked more like commercial aerospace than government contract aerospace. Because if it was government contract, there would be things like work breakdown structures, uh, percent complete revenue recognition. They're, government contractors get audited by the U.S. government every year. 
and it's pretty stringent. So that's actually a very good point because one of the things that I could not notice anywhere mm-hmm. is going to be project-based manufacturing. A lot of ERP system, for example, Epicor and Force of the world are probably going to have that, but I don't know if IQMS really supports the true hybrid manufacturing scenarios that a lot of manufacturing companies are going to require. So good point there, Andy. Now we are going to look at assembly. Again, assembly, in my opinion, it's not very differentiated industry, but they are trying to differentiate. But some of the things that I could see that are going to be fairly unique that I have not seen in case of other ERP is probably going to support multiple process processes and multiple cycle times that create one unique part number and multiple part numbers depending upon your need. Now, this seems very tricky. I don't know. I have not seen this manufacturing process before, to be honest. And I have not seen this supported by any ERP system. So maybe... It, isn't that just co-products? That's what I would guess, probably. But yeah, maybe there the are plastic, no answers to it. From the plastic uh, injection molding, they do that all the time, right? You have a left kind of... You, you, you make a, a set of cutlery of plastic fork, knife, and spoon, and it's all one shot. Yeah, But I mean, they are saying that multiple cycle times and multiple processes and create just one unique part number. So in case of, if you look at byproduct or co-product, you are probably going to have two SKUs there because your process is producing two different SKUs. It's not going to be one. In this particular case, it's different. It's saying create one unique part number after going for multiple processes. But if I look at this is just going to be your multi-level bomb. I mean, what's the difference? I, I... I don't know. Or multiple part numbers. They are saying or multiple part numbers. That's going to be your co-product or byproduct. So maybe there is a manufacturing product that I personally not have seen. Maybe you guys have seen. You guys can tell me if there's anything unique. Is yes. this talking about subcomponents possibly? No, no. That, uh, they would not talk about that. Yeah, Yeah, because it's one unique part number, multiple cycle times. I, I that, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Maybe I was thinking maybe some kind of sub-assemblies involved mm-hmm. in yeah. the overall product. And the, yeah, the zero right. so you you got, case. yeah, yeah. So you got maybe a multiple sub assemblies coming into a batch and queue, and then you're yep. queuing out of that yep. with a different cycle time to get to finished goods. It seems like we are agreeing that you know there is no differentiation for the assembly, so we can probably move on. Uh, <laughs> okay, so food and beverage. I mean, there is a real differentiation here in this particular case because they are able to support things like reformulation. Now, reformulation is a very tricky process, to be honest. If you don't have that built as part of your ERP system, then you will not be able to do that. A, a lot of companies, they implement your process manufacturing at this speed, and they are going to have fun with it. I can guarantee this. <laughs> okay, so so the, these guys are able to support the reformulation. They are able to support, uh, you know, multi-plant seasonal demand forecasting. And by the way, Andy, I think you are going to like this comment, okay? Since they were designed for chemicals and plastics, and chemicals sort of, uh, you know, sits in between or discrete in process, in my mind, okay? They have a lot of formulas. They have a lot of tricky products that typically discrete industries are not going to see. And that could be the reason why they are doing really, really well in case of your food and food ERP, food and beverage ERP, because they are going to have similar processes as your chemical process. And that's why they were able to build some features that that are going to really support uh, the food industry. So they have a lot of different things. For example, you know, your multi-plant seasonal demand forecasting. But again, I don't think Sneha is going to like this because this is built as part of the ERP system. I don't know any SNOP practitioners that they like the ERP demand forecasting. Okay, uh, we can debate, uh, you know, some other time about that. They have private label functionality, which is going to be very, uh, you know, tricky in case of uh, food and beverage. If you don't have that, then obviously you are going to face a lot of challenges. Uh, you also have the batch lot serial control traceability, recall management, uh, you know, volume scheduling, uh, advanced sequencing. Sequencing is going to be very different in your food products and your bakery products. That's a that's that's a tricky one. You also have two-way lot traceability. Again, I think the pre-assigned lots that Acumatica has introduced, these guys are probably going to have all of that. Uh, you also have first expire, first out. That's a very unique capability for the food and beverage. Okay, they also have robust labeling option. Again, I think they have a lot of functionality for the food and beverage industry, to be honest, okay? So for if you are a food and beverage uh, customer, you should probably take a serious look at, at, at IQMS. Okay, then we are going to look at plastics. Okay, plastics was their baby to begin with, okay? And plastics as well, again, it's a very unique, tricky industry. You are going to have things like recipes and blends, okay? Your discrete system is not gonna have all of that. If your discrete guy is actually trying to sell into plastic, they are overselling, I can almost guarantee this, okay? So 
be careful. When you are in the plastics, you need to buy a plastic software because it's a very unique industry. When you are in chemicals, that's a very unique industry as well. They have things like, you know, family tools. Again, that does not exist. Family tools, in my opinion, I found it to be slightly unique overall in terms of functionality. I don't think discrete vendors can, can uh, implement that. So family tools are easily handed and the system is designed to understand multiple part numbers within the same physical tool. I think this works really, really well in case of your furnaces. If you have a furnace as part of your manufacturing process, you probably would require this. And this is the same thing I think uh, chemical and plastic industries are going to have that as well. Uh, regrind uses uh, con consumption features. Again, it's a very unique functionality in the plastic industry. Uh, it's going to be very hard to build on top of your discrete system. So yeah, you really need to take a very serious look at a plastic ERP if you are uh, trying to compete there. Injection molders, blow molders, again, they have very unique uh, scheduling requirement. In my opinion, their bombs are very different as well. And the shelf life management, that's going to be fairly similar to your food and beverage. But in case of chemical, just because you are dealing with a lot of hazardous uh, you know, products, you are going to have very unique uh, quality processes uh, that you would require. Packaging, not too sure if they have a real differentiation, to be honest, okay? <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest here. They have things like you know, tool-based bombs, just because that is actually coming from your plastics. They have ability to handle your dyes and inks. Uh, uh, that could be a stretch. Uh, so I could not find anything that is going to be super unique for the packaging industry. But, uh, you know, they have a little bit of differentiation. Then they have uh, mentioned some more industry. They are going after a lot of, uh, you know, discrete verticals here. I'm not too sure if they are really fit for discrete verticals. We'll look at some of the reviews for the discrete as well. But for the most part, the way their positioning is, they were really designed for the plastics. And that's why they were uh, able to easily move to medical device. And they were easily moved to chemicals. They were easily moved to food and beverage and that's where they win most to be honest if you look at their case studies that's where they are winning really 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 well okay they have a little bit of you know in case of stamping and metal erp uh, they have mentioned that they have the tool maintenance which was slightly unique in my mind i just could not find if it was really unique for that i don't know what you guys found if you have any comments there where you are going to have any specific unique needs that may not be supported by your manufacturing software, I'm willing to hear. So tool maintenance, Sam, could that be expanded to include other facility maintenance? No, this is different. Mm -hmm. So other facility maintenance, I guess, is going to be supported by your, your mainstream manufacturing ERP software as well. That's a very different play. I was thinking that if you have any specific scenarios related to your tool, the way your tool is utilized in your process. Sometimes mm -hmm. it could be end to one scenario and that's where the complexity typically is in case of your ERP selection, but I could not find that here. If you are simply looking for multi-plant view for your tools and assets, ah, your Apicors, your Enforce, uh, I think they'll be able to handle that as long as mm -hmm. they have real multi-site functionality. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just saying this, this says to easily track and schedule preventative maintenance on your tools and dies. And I, I was just wondering if that. So uh, this is what I find fluff. So when you mm -hmm. say easily track, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> so everything's easy, isn't it? Yeah. So it doesn't mean anything in my mind. I am looking for very specific signals. If they are mm -hmm. going to have any unique functionality requirement, that is something I could not find tool maintenance, even though they are calling that stamping and metal is going to require these specific functionality. For example, let's say if you look at flexible unit of measure, that is going to be supported even by your distribution ERP systems. So that's not really unique as such for metal and stamping. They are right. overselling themselves to, to for these features. That's where my differentiation, if they have really, really unique functionality for a specific vertical, then you know I would let them win on that. But if they don't, then you know they are probably overselling. Yeah, I don't see anything on here that's specific for stamping or, or that type of companies. But the fact that it's designed for and specialized always in plastic injection molding, which is long run repetitive, stamping is the same. So there's mm -hmm. probably some functionality that does blend there. Yeah. So, guys, one of the things that you are going to notice when you look at their capabilities is this is the only ERP system that I could find. Obviously, if you are going to have an ERP system from Oracle, 
it's going to be hosted on the Oracle database. There's no question about that, okay? That's no brainer, <laughs> but this is the only ERP system which still utilizes Oracle database. Uh, one of the reasons could be because it's from 1980s. At that time, probably Oracle was the only, <laughs> and they could never upgrade their technology to the newer platform. Again, Oracle is a very, it's it's phenomenal company. There is no question about that. If you look at the enterprise scenarios, a lot of companies, when they do custom development, they utilize Oracle a lot because it's going to have Java. Java is considered to be slightly more secure programming language. So they are going to have a lot of uh, Oracle presence. But in case of your ERP verticals, typically I have not seen Oracle being used as the database. So this is a, 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 a sort of interesting finding for me because now you are tightly coupling yourself with Oracle. Now, the question you are going to ask is, okay, are they also utilizing the infrastructure from Oracle? Because Oracle does not really have as big cloud footprint as we saw in Oracle documentation as AWS is going to have or your Azure is going to have. So now that makes it a very interesting offering overall. We are also going to look at if this is a true cloud offering because I don't think they are really utilizing any of the public cloud. They are really utilizing their own hosted data center, which I find slightly alarming. If you are a pure cloud, most of the, the companies that are even going to be close to being fake cloud they are probably utilizing public cloud right now, even if they have simply lifted and shifted their workloads, but not IQMS. Okay, so we are going to look at, uh, you know, one of the things that I did not mention is their product line. So you have the product line called, uh, you know, Enterprise IQ and the Web IQ. Web IQ is positioned as the SaaS product. To be honest, when I look at their YouTube video, you are not going to find a single video after 2019. Can you believe this? Okay, if you are going to have a mainstream company, you will probably guess that they are going to publish something after they get acquired. So that's what I meant by just getting disappeared from the market. Okay, I could not find a single press release. Okay, they have done a lot of public appearances, but they have not done any press releases as such. Now, that could be because, you know, they are doing press releases combined, but then your the SAW system is actually maintaining the domain. They are doing a lot of work on the IQMS domain but you are actually not doing the press releases separately. Now, that's a red flag for me, to be honest, okay? But are you not committed to the product? What is happening? <laughs> are you simply trying to sell because you are simply trying to gain the market share? So that's a very interesting play. But overall, from the product footprint perspective, you have the enterprise IQ, you have the web IQ. Enterprise IQ was always very on-prem, okay? It was a very outdated product, okay? Just like your... Other products were there in the market. Some companies started their cloud journey in 2011. Some started in 2015. Companies like Capicor started in 2021. Okay, <laughs> that's a topic for debate for the next time. But <laughs> it seems like IQMS has not started it at all. Can you believe that? Okay, at least I could not find. Okay, so we need to see they have painted up a, a really pretty screens. And that is also I could find in just one or two product videos. That's all. Okay. There is not a single screenshot in any of their data sheets. Can you, can you believe this, guys? Why would you not <laughs> paste a screenshot on your data sheet when you, know, you are trying to sell an enterprise software product? So that's a huge red flag for me that, okay, you are trying to say that you are really good, but I don't have your screenshots. Why? <laughs> okay, guys, so this is their deployment model. Again, this looks like as if I, as the ERP reseller, is like to, trying to sell my cloud, to be honest, the way this is presented. Okay, that's how their cloud offering is. So it really looks as if they have not really invested anything on cloud. The only thing they have done is simply lifted and shifted, and they probably have a pretty screen just to sort of integrate everything and then present as, as one product. Now, I don't know which offering uh, they are trying to sell as cloud and which is going to be sold as on-prem. That visibility I could not find anywhere in, in their documentation. Now, look at their screen. So this is the, the screen. And by the way, this is from 2021, guys. And this is coming from one of their top resellers. And they have actually posted this video. And this reseller used to sell SolidWorks before. Now, they are actually trying to sell more offerings as part of their portfolio. So uh, obviously, one of the most logical thing that you would think that, you know, they are going to sell IQMS because all of the SolidWorks customers that I had, I'm actually going to sell them, uh, you know, my IQMS. So if you look at the screenshot, and this is coming from 2021, guys. Now, this looks really outdated. If you pay attention to the screen, this looks as if this was done in 1980s, guys. <laughs> okay, even my Apicode looks far, far better. 
<laughs> even though I have called it as fake cloud, but this is really outdated, guys. Okay, and this is coming from 2021, and this is the only video that I could find that is done in 2021. So these are current screens, are they? I mean, they are trying to demo to the customer because they have published in 2021. Why would they show an outdated product? It it, it would not make any sense. And, and you said, did I get that right? This is a SolidWorks reseller that is promoting this ERP solution? Yep, that's right. Inter interesting. So now we are going to look at some of the reviews. Obviously, reviews are all over the place, to be honest. Okay, some reviews are really happy. There are some recent reviews which were not happy overall. But one of the consistent theme that you are going to find in their reviews is that uh, the companies that are going to have slightly more complex sub-assemblies those companies are not really happy with the product just because the way product is designed. There are other concerns such as the accounting wasn't as great. Andy, uh, we could see some more reviews. Maybe you want to touch on those as well. But for the most part, I think the primary reasoning that I could see is going to be really uh, related to the complexity of the bombs. When that increases, uh, IQMS is, is probably not the right fit. And the slowness as well, because obviously it's a very outdated product. Uh, you're dead on. And it, as you know, I uh, emailed you a few other similar type reviews. And the common theme is that the ones that said positive things were in plastics or chemicals. Yeah, I mean, honestly speaking, I have seen some of the other positive ones as well. For example, let's say if you look at medical device, because medical device is a very unique industry. I have seen really positive case studies uh, in the medical device industry, because I don't think they are going to find anything else other than IQMS that can do this much, to be honest, okay? So I have seen that. But again, I think it's all over the place overall in terms of the reviews. Now, we are going to look at one of two screens from 2018, guys, okay? So one of these screens look as if this is a SaaS product. These are, the, this is how the SaaS product looks. I mean, if you actually look at the software as a service, they are going to have very clean interface. They are going to, uh, they are not going to have buttons that are going to, appear as if they were designed in 1980s. It's going to look like a product that was designed for today's age. So now this is the 2018 product. Now, I don't know if this is really the cloud product or they have a bunch of products underneath that they are trying to integrate. So some screens are going to appear like modern, but the other ones are going to be super ugly. <laughs> okay, so this is a very interesting slide. And then we could find some of the other screens, such as you look at this really outdated guys, and this is the the job shop, uh, you know, product demo, and this was done in 2018. So until 2018, I don't think they had any sort of investment in cloud. Now, let's look at, uh, you know, some more. Uh, this is the product overview video from YouTube that was done in 2018. This is also 2018. If you look at their menus, boy, this reminds me of my old Windows system, Windows 7 or probably older than that. And this actually looks like the the <laughs> Internet Explorer of those days, maybe IE5. Okay, so it's really old, guys. It's really outdated. And by the way, this is the demo from 2018. Now, let's look at some more screens here. Now, this is the, the pretty picture. Okay, this is what you are going to see in your demos, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, if the salesperson is really good, they are going to brush off on everything else. And the only thing you are going to see is this screen. And then you are going to feel, oh, my goodness, I love IQMS. But guys, devil's always in details. So you need to pay attention to every single screen, how whether it is really modernized. Uh, but if you actually pay attention even to these screens, if you look at the, the, the buttons, they still appear the same the way they were appearing in the last screen, even though they have made it far prettier. And there are some details here that you need to pay attention to. Okay, so the buttons are very i5, uh, you know, style. But I think they may have done a little bit of lifting and shifting and, and somehow ported this to cloud and maybe selling as cloud. I don't know what is sold as part of the cloud and what is not sold. Uh, but if you look at just the home screen, they do look significantly pretty. Yeah, I, I think I think you really nailed it this this week, you know, and, and Andy's comments, too. It's exactly the way this looks there. They're, where they come from, they're, they're, they got a lot of strength. But I think their their uh, vertical market list read um, aspirational more than reality. And and I think that's a caution for all of us that are looking at different ERPs. If they're, you know, the defense one probably is who their owner is, and the and the manufacturing and some of the discrete ones 
they don't they didn't put anything in place that really gave you any confidence that they actually have depth or differentiation there. But if you're in plastics or something that has that type of a process, this looks like a pretty good, you know, although aged a little bit, a pretty solid platform. Just one thing to add there, Phil, overall, let's say if you are targeting five markets, obviously you are going to invest all of your dollars there. Your marketing strategy, the product strategy is aligned, going to be aligned with those five verticals. But it's not that you are going to say no to a customer who is going to be slightly more discreet centric and maybe product may work, right? So, so that's why the marketing positioning is really important where they are investing their dollars. In their case, obviously their primary target market is really plastics and medical device. That's where they are super strong in my opinion. Obviously food right. and beverage, they are super strong as well. But if they're gonna use solid, solids works resellers, you know, that, that's where those guys live in a lot of discrete world. And, and, and some of the concerns on their cloud platforms and the look and feel of the software are definitely some red flags on this one. So just one quick comment, Phil, overall, uh, you know, with that positioning, because uh, SolidWorks does have a lot of medical device customers. They have, they require a very deep PLM capabilities. So they are going to have a little bit of play there because the PLM needs to be integrated as part of your core offering. The quality management needs to be there. So SolidWorks does have a play there, but you are right. That's a red flag because they have never sold ERP. They don't understand ERP. CAD system is not your ERP, guys. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned this before, but uh, IQMS, when they first start, well, not when they first started out, but up until about 10 years ago, uh, when they were exclusively targeting plastic injection molding, their reputation was impeccable. Anyone you spoke to that had their product loved it. The customer support was phenomenal, everything. Uh, since they've diversified or attempted to diversify and gone in some other target markets, I think that they've lost a little bit of uh, the, the public confidence. But with, you know, SolidWorks has got, they've got a built-in, uh, market share right off the bat. So I'm sure it's going to be positive for them in that regard. Something um, on the same lines as what uh, Andy mentioned, like diversification in so many varied markets was something that just stood out to me and exactly how are they really going after each of them? Like what's their value prop? You cannot have like w what's unique about you that is that will be uniquely sold to each of these uh, different markets. At least I haven't um, seen an ERP uh, going across, you know, uh, so many markets and trying to, you know, create a position. And maybe um, to what Andy said, that could be something that they could work on and see how they could, you know, target their marketing campaign. If they, if they do really think that they could tangent and um, span across all these market segments. And Sam, I just want to say this was a really exciting uh, discussion today, and I learned a lot. Thank you to my fellow panelists. It's always a pleasure to um, engage with you, and um, this this was uh, really full of uh, value. So thank you, Sam. Hey, we all know how to spell IQMS now, right? We do. <laughs> <laughs> and say and say Deso. And Deso, so. how to pronounce Deso. <laughs> On that note, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about ND Radical, head over to essoft.com. It's E-S-S-O-F-T dot com. If you want to learn more about Phil Kerper, head over to ringlingbusinesssolutions.com. It's R-I-N-G-L-I-N-G-B-U-S-I-N-E-S-S-S-O-L-U-T-I-O-N-S.com. If you want to learn more about Angela Thurman, head over to thurmanco.com. It's T-H-U-R-M-A-N-C-O.com. If you want to learn more about Sneha Kamari, follow her on LinkedIn. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Ken Hedelwick, who discusses the nuances of the PPAP process for machine shops serving the automotive market. Also, the interview with Tom Rodden, who discusses the nuances of medical device manufacturing and how it differs from generalized manufacturing. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.